In the last video, we looked at the geometric product of multivectors. However, we only looked at it algebraically. Since it's called the geometric product, what does this product actually look like geometrically? That is what we will answer in this video. This video is a part of From Zero to Geo, a series where we formulate geometric algebra, an incredibly powerful branch of mathematics, from the ground up. So what does the geometric product of multivectors look like geometrically? Well, we already saw a couple of videos ago how the geometric product affects vectors geometrically, so let's start there. The fundamental geometric idea that I presented behind the geometric product is that parallel directions contract while perpendicular directions join. I've said that before, but I want to take a closer look at what I mean when I say that. When we have two parallel vectors pointing in the same direction, the geometric product is the product of their lengths. In a sense, the two copies of this direction disappear in the product. They're not quite canceling, since the magnitudes are still present in the product, but the directions themselves are gone. This is what we mean by contraction. It's an action that removes a common direction from consideration while still including the magnitude. When we have two perpendicular vectors, the geometric product is the bivector that the two vectors make. We can think of this bivector as being the original two vectors joined together, so we call this process joining. In general, joining is the process of taking two objects and producing a bigger object containing both of them. Notice that contracting and joining seem to be kind of dual operations to each other. Contraction lowers the dimension of the objects, while joining raises the dimension of the objects. Or, using the grade terminology, contraction is a grade lowering operation, while joining is a grade raising operation. Now think back to how we extended the geometric product algebraically. We took the equations for the product of basis vectors and said that they applied to the vector parts of multivectors as well. This means that the fundamental geometric idea behind multiplying vectors works for multiplying multivectors as well. When multiplying two multivectors, parallel parts contract while perpendicular parts join. But what exactly does that mean in the context of multivectors? Consider these two bivectors. They're perpendicular, right? So shouldn't we be joining them? Maybe into a trivector? However, notice that the bivectors do have components that are parallel. Should we be contracting as well? What exactly should we do? Let's look at several examples to figure this out. We already know how to perform all of these multiplications algebraically, so we can use the algebraic answer to see what the answer is. Once we see the answer, we can start to think about how the product itself acts geometrically. Let's start with something simple like e1 times e12. Algebraically, this is equal to e2. So what happened here geometrically? Well, notice that each factor in this product has e1 in it. So there's a common direction between the two factors. Thus, we do a contraction, but only with the e1 parts. This leaves e2, which is the final result. Remember, when contracting, the magnitudes are still important. If we had 2 e1 times e12, the 2 in the first factor would be present in the result as well. So what about e2 times e12? Well, the same thing happens here. Both factors have e2 in it, so they contract. This leaves just e1, although from the algebra, we know that the result is minus e1. Wait, how do we know after contracting which sign the result should have? You could just go through the algebra to figure this out, and that's often the way to go when working in higher dimensions, but in this case there is a nice geometric argument we can make. Notice that when we multiplied e1 by e12, the result was e1 rotated by 90 degrees counterclockwise. When we multiplied e2 by e12, the result was e2 rotated by 90 degrees counterclockwise. So it seems that multiplying a vector by e12 rotates it by 90 degrees counterclockwise. The orientation of e12 is counterclockwise as well, which is a nice way to remember what multiplying by e12 does. But what if we are multiplying a vector that is not some scalar multiple of e1 or e2 by e12? For example, what is e1 plus e2 times e12? Well, we could just work through the algebra again. In this case, we see that the result is still the original vector rotated by 90 degrees. However, 
Another way we could think of this is that since bifactors don't care about their exact shape as long as their orientation and magnitude are the same, we could rotate the bifactor without changing it, and in this view we can apply the previous arguments. In general, multiplying any two-dimensional vector by E12 will rotate it by 90 degrees counterclockwise. But wait, the geometric product is not commutative. What happens if we multiply by E12 on the left? Well, we already know what happens algebraically. E12 times E1 is minus E2, and E12 times E2 is E1. Looking at these results, it seems that multiplying by E12 on the left rotates by 90 degrees, but this time it's clockwise instead of counterclockwise. Again, this generalizes to all 2D vectors. Multiplying by E12 on the left rotates by 90 degrees clockwise. But this has all been in two dimensions. What about multiplying a vector and a bivector in three dimensions? Let's consider the product E3 times E12. In this case, there are no common directions at all. Thus, we join in this case, combining E12 and E3 into E123. Now I haven't really talked about how to visualize trivectors, but here's how I usually draw them. I'll talk more about this visualization in a future video. The point is, when multiplying a vector that is perpendicular to a bivector, they join into a trivector. In this case, the sign is hard to figure out geometrically, and I always let the algebra do the talking when it comes to the sign. Here, the result is E123, not minus E123. But then what about the product of an arbitrary vector and bivector? Well, we can do the same thing we did when multiplying arbitrary vectors. We can split the vector into two parts, one which is in the plane of the bivector and the other which is perpendicular to the bivector. We can then distribute and calculate these two products separately. The first term is the 90 degree rotation of the parallel vector, while the second term is the trivector joining the bivector and the perpendicular vector. Things get even weirder with the product of two bivectors. Let's first consider something like E12 squared. We already saw in the last video that this produces a scalar, negative 1. Given the parallel directions contract rule, it should make sense that this produces a scalar since the two planes share all directions. However, this is not a case of two planes contracting. Instead, it is two separate directions contracting. The E1 and E2 parts contract separately. In two dimensions, there's not really any other interesting examples of the product of two bivectors, so let's jump to three dimensions already. What's the product of E12 and E23? This is the example we were looking at earlier. Should we contract or join? Well, let's look at the situation algebraically. When multiplying E12 and E23, the answer is E13. So the E2 direction that was common between the two of them did contract. But then after doing that contraction, the E1 and E3 parts join. So the answer to our earlier question of whether we should contract or join is that we do both. Any vector parts that are common between the two bivectors contract, while the vector parts that are not common join. To multiply two arbitrary 3D bivectors, we can do the same trick as always. Split one bivector into parts that are parallel and perpendicular to the other, distribute, and multiply the two parts separately. Looking at all of these examples, it looks like to calculate any product, we split one object into just two parts that are parallel and perpendicular to the other, distribute, and then calculate the product separately. However, the situation is different in four dimensions. In four dimensions, the bivectors E12 and E34 have no common parts. Thus, no contraction takes place, and we end up joining them all into a four vector E1234. To multiply two arbitrary bivectors in four dimensions, you need to split one bivector into three parts, one which is fully parallel to the other bivector, one which is half parallel and half perpendicular to the other bivector, and one which is fully perpendicular to the other bivector. Then, you can distribute and calculate each part separately. So in four dimensions, when multiplying bivectors, we have to split one of them into three parts, not two. You don't need this full split until you hit four dimensions, so you won't run into it too much in simple situations, but it's good to know what happens in the general case. In general, when multiplying two multivectors, you might need to split one object into arbitrarily many parts before you can distribute and multiply each part separately.
The general way that we multiply arbitrary multivectors in arbitrary dimensions is this. First, when multiplying two basis blades, all of the directions that are common between the two end up contracting, and the rest of the directions end up joining. Then, to multiply arbitrary multivectors, split one multivector into several parts that are each parallel and or perpendicular to the other, and then distribute and find the product of each part separately using contractions and joins. Of course, in higher dimensions, trying to figure this out geometrically is too confusing, so in these higher dimensional cases you should just calculate products algebraically anyway. In fact, I'm not going to require you to visualize any products in this way in dimensions higher than 2. I'm talking about all of this mainly to help you get more comfortable with working with the geometric product. Now I want to bring up a topic from a previous video, blades. Recall that in geometric algebra, not all homogeneous multivectors represent a particular geometric object. For example, the bivector E12 plus E34 does not represent a plane. Any multivector that does represent a particular geometric object we call a blade. However, I never gave a precise definition of what a blade is because we didn't yet have the tools to do so. Well, now we do. Consider any arbitrary bivector in two dimensions. Even though we might not draw it as a rectangle, we can always morph the bivector into an equivalent bivector that is a rectangle. Notice that a rectangular bivector has two vectors on its sides that multiply to that bivector. This works for any bivector in any dimension that can be represented by a single plane. If a bivector is a blade, then we can write the bivector as the product of two perpendicular vectors. Furthermore, when joining two perpendicular vectors, the result is a bivector in the plane of the two bivectors, meaning that it is a blade. Thus, a bivector is a blade if and only if it can be written as the product of two perpendicular vectors. It's harder to visualize this for other objects, but this ends up being true for higher grade objects as well. Every multivector is a blade if and only if it can be written as the product of perpendicular vectors. Since we haven't had any concrete definition of blade until now, let's take this as our definition. A multivector is defined to be a blade if it can be written as the product of perpendicular vectors. From this, it's actually possible to give a more rigorous proof that E12 plus E34 is not a blade. It's not too important to understand the proof, so I'll give a very quick sketch here that will probably move too fast to follow. If E12 plus E34 was a blade, it would be possible to write E12 plus E34 as the product of two four-dimensional vectors. But it turns out that satisfying this equation is impossible. The way you show that this is impossible is you find the formula for the product of two vectors in 4D, set it equal to E12 plus E34, and then look at each component separately. You end up getting seven scalar equations, although the first one ends up being irrelevant. From just these six equations, you can derive a contradiction. I don't want to bore you with the details of this since it's just some elementary algebra with a few tricks. If you really want to, you can work it out for yourself. Play around with these equations until you get a contradiction. So we now know how to multiply multivectors, both algebraically and geometrically. While we could jump into the applications of the geometric product right away, there is one more thing we should talk about. The multiplication of scalars satisfies all of these conditions. Which of them are true for the geometric product? That is what we will answer in the next video.